Hi, my name is Tosi Oshino and I'm an under 40 CEO. The African Renaissance. The concept that the African people and nation shall overcome the current challenges confronting the continent and achieve cultural, scientific, and economic renewal is here and with young men and women taking the lead. Some call them the new school heroes. We call them under 40 CEOs. Tosin is a young architect whose journey into the world of building design started early in life. She had aspired to be an architect from looking at building plans her father would bring home when she was in secondary school, select her room from the plan and would follow her father to construction sites. She pursued her dreams to the Architecture Association London, where she graduated as an architect and also holds a master's degree in urban design from the Bartlett School of Architecture, University College London. Tosi is the principal architect at CM Design Atelier. All right, welcome to Under 40 CEOs, Tosi. Hello. All right, Tosi, you attended Queen's College and then, of course, you left for London where you bagged your degree in architecture from the University of Kingston, yes, I believe. Yes, that's uh, right. But not much has been said about growing up in Lagos. I mean, tell me about growing up in Lagos and what informed, you know, your career choice. Wow, okay, so I grew up in Lagos initially. Um, I mean, prior to that, actually, when we were very little, we were in the UK. Um, my dad was studying to be a gynecologist, and then we left to come back to Lagos in 1986. Um, we lived in Lawanson for a while in my grandparents' house, and then we moved to Ketu. Alakwara Ketu, one of the LSTP housing estates there. And then from there we moved to Ikoi, and from Ikoi we went to Lekki. But um, I went to primary school, um, Great Children's School, Bogada. Okay. Yeah, on the mainland. Uh, uh, it's owned by a family member, so a lot of Oshinos mm -hmm. actually went to that school, okay. which was good. And then obviously on to Queen's College. Okay. After Queen's College, I did my A-levels um, in Harrogate in North Yorkshire. Okay. Um, and then obviously on to university. But Lagos was good growing up. I have very fond memories of, of Lagos as a child. Okay, beautiful. Now, I mean, just talking to you before this interview started, I've been trying to get a glimpse, you know, into how the mind of an architect <laughs> works. You know, how would you say the mind of an architect typically works? Oh, we're spatially inclined, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we're always thinking about spaces, thinking about lights, um, thinking about uh, the, the feeling people have when they enter a space. So, I mean, that consciously is, is, is how we approach our work. And obviously then the aesthetics, you know, the materials, the colors that you use. But I think as an architect in particular, my work, I'm very particular about trying to ensure that people are impacted. People should notice when they get there that someone's paid a bit more attention to the work that's been done. Okay, beautiful. So I have a few architect friends mm -hmm. uh, and I find that they're able to, you know, apply themselves creatively in any field, you know, or endeavor. Yeah. You know, what about your training? Mm as an architect makes you this special? Oh, um, I think just generally architecture, I mean, we're considered um, as a profession as master builders, uh, but actually your education also makes you dabble into other realms. So for example, you will have some architects who will dabble into product design. For example, we do chairs. Um, you have architects who dabble in photography, who oh, dabble nice. in animation. Um, obviously in interiors, in fashion. I mean, the list really is endless because it's about creativity. If you, if you have an inclination to be creative, and especially as an architect, it gives you a, a stepping stone or a bounce to many other things, many other disciplines. Okay, amazing. So the British Council yes. um, said that you've been involved in a number of notable projects. Now, which one of those projects you know, excites you till this day? British Council projects? Or yes. what? Um, I, I was part of a, a, a team that was selected to take part in um, a project called Playable Cities, where they had a team coming from Bristol called Watershed. Oh. They came with uh, six participants from the UK and seven from Lagos, and you had to be selected. So it was quite exciting. Mm. We came together for two weeks, and we started looking at this idea of play in the city, in particular Lagos. Um, in a city where we have so much hustle and bustle, do people actually get the opportunity as adults to play? Um, we came up with three proposals. The one that I was involved in was called Jiggy Lagos, where we had an interactive mirror that spoke to you when you walked past. 
it was very, very interesting. How did you make that happen? <laughs> it was all electronic, you know, it's oh, nice. using technology. So it used infrared light. Um, so obviously when somebody breaks the light, then the voice comes out of the mirror. And then we had a few enactments. That's amazing. So in an interview, um, you granted, um, you said, and permit me to quote you, mm -hmm. there's a lot of creative competition in Nigeria. So if you want to be known, you have to show yourself mm. to the world. Now, how does one ensure that one gets oneself and one's work out there without it seeming, you know, uh, perceived negatively mm. as self-promotion? Mm. First of all, there is nothing wrong with self-promotion. I don't have an issue with it, but I think it's how it's done. Mm. It should be done in a professional manner. I am part of an old profession, um, and our professional body does not necessarily approve of commercial advertising. Okay. But at the end of the day, the most important thing is letting people know the value that you add and that you are available to do this work. Um, I've been very particular about ensuring that the work that we have produced as an office has been seen and they know that we're the ones that did it. Okay. I think the thing about architecture, which is so interesting, is we're so stealth. We're mm -hmm. all around us. There's no city in the world that exists without buildings being put up. And every single building will have people behind it who've delivered it. Okay. But it is not uncommon to walk past a building and not even think about the team. And to think, oh, you know, that was actually somebody's work. When you start to produce architecture that people are noticing, people mm -hmm. will ask questions. Who was behind it? And if people ask those questions and you're able to put your work on a platform that can be seen, then people can relate and connect you with the project and you can potentially get more work. Tosi, who has handled several projects within the Lagos Metropolis, designed the iconic black box that is the Maryland Mall. Prior to setting up a practice, experiences have been shaped by working in leading organizations internationally, Skidmore Owing and Merrill's LLP London, and the Office of Metropolitan Architecture in Rotterdam, where she was part of the team that designed the fourth mainland bridge proposal in 2008. Upon repatriation to Lagos, she practiced at James Cubitt Architects and was team lead on notable projects, including the master plan and corporate head office building for Nigeria LNG in Port Harcourt. Her work on the proposed fourth mainland bridge, she said, was intense and futuristic. The team that designed the bridge included five other persons and took about 10 weeks to complete. I sense your frustration with what you have termed, you know, Lagos's, you know, haphazard yeah. growth. Yes. Um, so what would you say are the real issues and given a chance, how would you resolve them? Well, um, Lagos is, is such a beautiful city. Um, one, because of how it's come about, we're, we're here because of the ports. Um, it has grown as a city because of trade and, and our access to be able to uh, reach international markets or bring things from in from international markets. But we've obviously had a lot of growth which has been uncontrolled and urban development has not followed the, that, that initial sprawl of people. Um, really what Lagos needs and is being done is transport. Transport, transport, transport. The more efficient our transport system is, the more uh, livable the city will be and it will be um, more efficient you know in terms for businesses in terms for 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 development if we're able to get the road network um, to work well then you know a lot of the other problems will be solved and and I, I and I do know that a lot of the work that's being done by the current administration has been pushing this idea of transport um, efficiency really Okay, beautiful. So you have um, talked about your industry yeah. being dominated by men. Yes. Now, how would you say a man <laughs> has an advantage over a woman in your industry? Uh, architecture as an old profession, um, but it is a male-dominated profession. If it's not necessarily the consultants, it's uh, the contractors. Uh, we deal with engineers on a daily basis. It's not uncommon to know that the number of women who actually register as engineers is maybe 30% of, 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 of the overall class. But even within architecture, it's the same thing. You, you, the higher up you get, the more experienced you get, there are fewer and fewer women within the profession. And the reality is when you're on a building site, you know, um, as a woman, there's, there's a certain level of composition you need to, you need to place. I, I like to liken myself to someone like Margaret Thatcher. 
um, particularly because she had to learn how to speak in a monotone voice. You have to learn how to compose yourself appropriately, especially when you're dealing in a male-dominated industry. Because the minute that you appear to emotionally approach things, all rationale or reason for your, for your comment or your intent is lost. And they will just be like, oh, it's because she's a woman. So you're so conscious of it that um, you need to um, present yourself in a certain way. But I won't say it's necessarily a disadvantage. Um, I think in particular in my case, when people don't expect you to deliver, and you do, then people remember you. I'll have you know that mm -hmm. I really don't know too many architects who are out there. Yes. Um, and the few that I know of, maybe five, three are actually women. Mm. And I see, I look at your space, and then there's a lady as well. It's a lady who designed my house. That's great. You know, and then I look at your space, I walk into your studio, and the entire team looks like there's more women, and I see just one guy. <laughs> So would you, would you say um, you're, you're an advocate and you're, you're trying to bring more women mm. you know, into prominence in the, prof, in the profession? Um, I mean, this is, this is very interesting because I do look at my team and I do realize that I have a, a lot of women in the team. Yeah. And I think, to be honest, people, people are attracted to, to, to aspirational goals. You know? So I, I'm happy that I've inspired a lot of younger women in my profession to realize that it is possible to achieve or attain success. Um, and do it the, the appropriate way based on merit. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that at the end of the day, especially in a professional environment, you shouldn't carry gender as, 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 as a cape of honor or, or a disadvantage. I do take on um, people in my team based on merit and based on the value that they add. Yeah. But if we end up being a team of women who are doing good work, then I don't, I don't see a problem with it. All right, so let's go back to how you started this business, at what point, you know, after working with several firms, did you decide, you know, it's time to set up my own firm? Well, you know, um, you know, this journey is quite personal. Everyone has uh, different aspirational goals and, and what they want to achieve in life. And um, I went to a very strong design school in the UK, the Architecture Association, where I finished my final degree. Um, Zaha Hadid also went there as well. There are a lot of <laughs> big famous architects who've passed through okay. that lineage. And um, it's a design school in particular. It's not just architecture. They, they push this, uh, this element of, of design and creating um, evolution, um, revolutionary design. So you're constantly pushing the boundary of, of what can be achieved. Mm. And then coming back to um, Lagos and working in a practice here, and I, I was beginning to get, I would say, a little bit frustrated because I wasn't getting the opportunity to push that skill set. It's one thing to design a building that can be built. It's another thing to design a building that people sit up and think, okay, this is a bit different, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and really on that quest, I started to look at opportunities outside. And obviously when I got the opportunity to, to do a project that would set me apart, I, I jumped at it. So I didn't really start thinking, okay, you know what, I want to set up an office. I was really looking for opportunities to explore design and aesthetic, which I wasn't able to do in the practice that I was in. And I'm happy to say that um, as an office, we, we do a lot of interesting work at very different scales. We, we work on, on, in retail, we work bars, coffee shops, you know, we do residential houses, we obviously done them all, you know, but the scales are different, but the challenges um, are consistent in the fact that we're always pushing this idea of design and what can actually be created. Okay, beautiful. So you talked about your first project, you know, and that's how you started. So what yeah. was that first project as CM Design? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, um, it was actually on the beach, you know, which is oh. quite exciting. So um, it was um, one of the beach houses that we've done. We've, we're on number eight and nine at the moment. Yeah. Um, but nice. <laughs> <laughs> which is, it's, 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 that for me is testimony that we're doing something right because people, um, are coming via referral. So they see something that we've done mm -hmm. and then, you know, they ask us to do theirs. But the first one was, was Campy Carrot. And then it's also just having the opportunity of a client trusting you enough to be able to deliver on a project. And really that's all an architect needs, that initial opportunity to deliver. But when the opportunity comes, you, bet, you best be ready, you know, <laughs> <laughs> because that is your legacy, you know. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So, I mean, earlier you mentioned you know, a few other disciplines where yeah. architects could actually apply themselves. And The Guardian mm. described you as an award-winning amateur uh, <laughs> photographer. Yes, yes. You know, so tell me about your work in that space. 
Ah, so, you know, uh, back in the day when I was still a student, <laughs> I used to dabble a lot into photography. Not so much now, just because, um, I guess, of constraints of time. But I entered the Etisa Lat uh, competition for Lagos Photo one year, mm -hmm. and I, I won third prize. Oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> which was exciting. Um, I submitted a piece which I called Great Expectations, which was taken at Ada our admin officer's um, house, where I photographed a, a small child who was walking down a corridor, and it was very interesting how the light kind of bounced off um, the, the slats within the within the roofing sheets. And I, I won third prize, and it was really exciting. And um, I mean, prior to that, I had had um, a small um, exhibition with a, with a good friend, Jide Alakija, and we called it um, uh, Changing Perspectives. And in, in that exhibition, I showcased work that I had, um, photography work that I had taken both in Lagos and in Jamaica in the Caribbean. Um, I had been there for four weeks as a student. We had gone to do um, a workshop with the, with the National Housing Trust. And we got the opportunity to drive around the island um, in a week and a half, you know, which was really cool. Okay, amazing. So um, you've been featured on a number of platforms. You know, you've got everybody talking. You know, what are these nods? What are these accolades? What do they mean to you? Ah, uh, you know, what's really interesting is that when I set up this office, I just wanted to make nice buildings. <laughs> I wanted to design and, and, and supervise the delivery of, of beautiful buildings. And um, it, it does make me pleased that it's been acknowledged, but that was not the intent. The intent was just to produce good work. I, I was very conscious that I wanted to show my skill to the world in terms of what I do as an architect, but not necessarily all the accolades that come with it. So I really, it's been really more icing on the cake, um, more than anything. Uh, it has opened a lot of doors. It's nice to know that when you go to certain meetings that um, people know you before you get there, so you're not having to do the big sell. Because as a young, young uh, CEO, you know, you sometimes feel like you have to, you know, constantly tell people what you're doing. And sometimes in the aggressiveness of that, it can be off-putting to, to an older client because it's like you're trying too hard. Mm -hmm. But with um, the situation that I sit in now where there's been a lot of recognition, I don't have that so much as a problem anymore. Okay. My competence is not questioned. All right. So tell me, what are those key challenges? Um, that you've had to overcome to make the strides you've made so far? Um, learning, learning how to work with people. I think, you know, that's the bit that no one teaches you. You can't learn that in school. It's either you have it or you don't. Learning how to interact with clients. Learning when to stop pushing. Very, very important. Because, you know, as an architect, you do have the agenda you want to push. You want to make sure that your buildings carry the same language. People should be able to see our projects and know that was a project done by CM Designer Tilia. You know, and sometimes when you're dealing with a client, you might not necessarily be answering their question because they're paying for they're paying for a service. And they know what they want as well. Most times they do. Um, and so you need to learn that healthy balance of being able to achieve what you want to showcase in terms of your work, but also ensuring that you you are able to provide the client with everything that they require from you. All right, so tell me, uh, I know you're well-traveled, so how has traveling and interacting with diverse cultures you know, helped to shape your person and of course the business? Um, it's very important, I think also in this profession of design, um, exposure, opportunities of seeing how other people do things. I mean, I see myself when I'm even in Europe now and I'm sitting there on my phone taking pictures of details, you know, and I'm sure people are just thinking, what's wrong with this person? <laughs> <laughs> but it's because I'm consciously absorbing and learning from what's around me and being able to bring it back and translate it into the work that we do here. Um, I think also learning about other cultures, how people um, use their spaces or how people interact is very important in, in how you deal with um, the everyday realities of your space. I can't underestimate the importance of travel. As a student, when I was studying architecture, I got the opportunity to go to a lot of the big international buildings that you know, I talked about in history books. I've been to Spain. I've um, um, seen Gaudi's work. You know, I've been to uh, France and seen uh, Le Corbusier's work. And to be honest, at the time, I didn't really appreciate it as important. But, you know, now when I think back and I, I see the decisions that I make in my work, I can see it's because I got the opportunity to be in those buildings. You know, a city like London that has so much architecture, you know, I, I actively go and look, even now as a practicing professional, and see what my peers or my senior colleagues are doing because you learn from 
everything around you. It's and and and, and things evolve. As I'm here now, there are young cats coming up as well. <laughs> How do you stay relevant? You know, it's so important. You know, so it's constantly exposing yourself and learning from the things around you that keep you ahead of your game. All right, talking about young cats. <laughs> I've seen some of the young cats um, working on your team, and I've seen yeah. you interact with them. Mm. So I've gotten a glimpse into your leadership style, but how would you describe your leadership style? I'm not the most patient of people. Um, I like things to be done properly. I always have an idea of what I want to achieve. And so it's the people who are able to deliver on that level of efficiency and time consciousness that, that um, we get on and we, we move forward. All right, beautiful. So tell me about your failures and failings as a leader. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> failures as a leader. Um, I have failures in life, uh, leadership style. I uh, maybe not um, being very conscious of of people's personal um, requirements in an office environment. I work very long hours, and I'm happy to work long hours. But I've always been like that. But I think also just being conscious that you know everyone that's with you, they do have lives. <laughs> And they should be able to have a very balanced existence. So um, I think that in particular we've struggled with slightly, but we're, we're getting a, a, a big hold on. But I think it's part of the process. You must fail. No one that reaches any great success got there on a smooth path. Mm -hmm. All right, tell me, so what values are important to you and your firm? Hard work, purpose. Purpose, purpose, purpose. You must have purpose. Um, a clear rationale, direction um, is very important, and focus, I think. Okay, beautiful. So what would you say is the biggest letdown you've had in your career so far? Biggest letdown? Um, I don't think we've had any letdown so far. I can't, I can't think of, of anything in particular. I mean, we're a young office. We're five years this October. Um, We've lost some jobs, we've gained some jobs, but, but every, um, every experience is a lesson. Sometimes you might lose a job because you overbid. Other times you might take a job that you underbid, but then you struggle to deliver it because you know, the money didn't balance out. You know. But, but you, you learn, I don't think anything's been a bad experience. Tosi has an amazing personality and has managed to totally enthrall me with her world. Tosi seems to be all about her work, but I am positive she has time dedicated for things other than work. How does she spend this time and what does she do with the resources she works so hard to generate? I'm about to find out. All right, let's move on to more fun stuff. Okay. Um, I have a few quick fire questions for you. What do you love to eat? Jollof rice. How would you describe your fashion style? Quirky, industrial, industrial. I think, okay. you know, I, I'm a denim denim chick, you know, I wear a lot of denim because I go to sites a lot, you know, I need to be comfortable, okay. but still look a little bit smart as well. So what other CEOs do you currently look up to? As an architect, Shegna Bjordan's work. I really like her work because she's been consistent in her style. Patrick Gray, he does a lot of interesting work. He is more like a master builder. He is able to bridge that world of contractor and architect. I love, um, I'll call her Auntie Jumoke. <laughs> I didn't know her practice. Um, I love what she does. Um, she has a very interesting, I would say her work is very avant-garde um, in terms of her style of architecture, but also she's been able to marry that world of not just being a practicing professional, but she's also a motivational speaker. And um, I can't imagine, also with family life, how she balances it all. But she's doing amazing things and the world has noticed, you know. So in terms of role model of where I would like to see my practice and what we're able to achieve. I, I look up to her. She's done amazing things. All right. What's your favorite car to drive? A Toyota. What's your favorite travel destination? Um, London, just because I spend so much time there. I do like Atlanta as well. Mm. I love the ATL, you know. So tell me, what's your favorite book of all time? Um, I read this when I was at university. Is by Zadie Smith called White Teeth. And it was actually looking at... White Teeth? White Teeth, yeah. Mm. And it looks at um, a, a young girl who is a uh, mixed race, you know. And, you know, growing up in a world where, you know, she's kind of in between cultures and trying to find her, her herself in that space. Um, and I think when... You're a Nigerian student 
who has been thrown from that from the culture of your homeland and you go away for school and you're struggling to kind of find yourself I don't think it's as much a problem now because there's so many people who do go but when you find yourself in an environment where you're kind of always the minority you know those kind of stories make you feel like you're 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 included all right what book are you reading right now uh, currently not reading anything at the moment I'm watching a lot of television a lot of series <laughs> But not reading, not reading. All right, so lastly, I'd like to know, Tosin, what makes you happy? In terms of work, being in the building when it's finished and standing there and everything you thought about creating has come together, you know. And, you know, it's just a very warm, fulfilling feeling. Um, Family-wise, spending time with my daughter, you know, she makes me so happy, you know, when I see this little person that is blossoming and growing into a beautiful little woman, she's my little madame, you know, she makes me very happy. All right then. <laughs> Thank you for coming on Under 40 CEOs, Tosi. Thank Tosie. you so much. Right. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tosi Oshino and you too can be an Under 40 CEO.